Early Life, 1890-1914 A great mind often originates from places which no one would have expected. Taishu's life started humbly in 1890. Born into a poor family under the name of Liu Peilin. With his father passing away, he was raised by his mother and her side of the family. As a young boy, his grandmother used to take him along on Buddhist pilgrimages. This first exposure would define his entire life. His family's financial situation soon forced him to seek work as a clerk. But it wasn't too long until he decided to leave his job in order to become a monk. As part of his initiation ceremony, he left his lay name behind and was given the Dharma name Tai Shu. One day, when he was 19 years old, while reading the large perfection of wisdom sutra, Tai Shu suddenly had an experience of enlightenment. Suddenly, my heart field was pure and empty. In an instant, I returned and regarded my body, my mind, and the material world as illusions and shadows. The meaning of the Mahaprajnaparamita Sutra brilliantly manifested itself. By becoming acquainted with revolutionary monks, it was possible for him to read translations of Tolstoy and Marx. He went on teaching at a number of associations up until 1914. Influenced by his readings in socialism, Tai Xu used his position to advocate rather radical reforms which were met with an unenthusiastic response. Disappointed by this reaction, he decided to go into seclusion on the island of Hutuo Shan. Seclusion, 1914-1917 While in seclusion, Tai Shu used the time to deepen his knowledge of the sutras. But he was also eager to read Western texts on logic, psychology, philosophy and applied science. He collected his reforms in over ten works, in order to grasp Taishu's reforms, we must first define what he saw as problematic. He categorized the problems in two groups. Problems with Buddhism and problems with the modern world. Taishu accused the traditional Chinese Buddhism of being otherworldly. The clergy, he criticized, was reclusive and didn't seem to be interested in secular things. The efforts in social services and education of the community were limited and so was the knowledge of the contemporary world. Furthermore, the familialism of the different Buddhist schools has led them to only live and think of themselves. His critique on the modern world derived mainly from his reaction to the First World War. The European war broke out. Added to the rottenness of the inward man was the brutal struggle of the outward world. I was convinced of the magnitude of the human calamity, which, like a wagon load of hay on fire, could not be extinguished with a cupful of water. With the progression of science, a theistic worldview and its moral ethics are becoming obsolete. The egoistic passions of humanity are no longer restricted. Science gave mankind great destructive power while at the same time stripping it of a theistic moral system. A dangerous downward spiral. But Tai Xu did not perceive science as evil. In fact, he 
He considered a symbiosis of science and Buddhism as necessary to harmonize East and West, tradition and modernity. To achieve this, the traditional Mahayana Buddhism had to be reduced to its essence, namely the law of cause and effect and the doctrine of thusness. He referred to this method of practice as the human vehicle. Life as a Reformer, 1918 to 1938. After three years, at the age of 29, Tai Xu emerged from seclusion in 1917. Shortly after, he began to put his ideas into action. His plan for the application of his reforms was based on education and public relations. He founded multiple lay societies, starting in Shanghai in 1918. The members of these lay societies were encouraged to reach out to the common people through social service, often in the form of running a primary school or a hospital for the poor, but also by distributing free literature and offering religious services in street chapels. The membership peaked in 1933 with up to 30,000 members per society. His first monastic academy, the Wu Chan Buddhist Academy, was founded in 1922. After mastering the six-year-long curriculum, students could graduate with the title of Dharma teacher. The weekly schedule consisted of Buddhist history and texts, but also secular topics like history, geography or psychology. The pedagogic techniques were modern and influenced by Western universities using textbooks, blackboards and open discussions. Another cornerstone of Tai Xu's application was the promotion of the human vehicle. With the founding of the Shanghai Lay Society in 1920, he also established the journal The Sound of the Sea Tide. The magazine covered a variety of topics from Chinese and Western philosophy, comparative religion to physical science. Until its last publication in 1949, it had the highest circulation of any Buddhist periodical in China. Furthermore, Tai Xu and his students traveled through China holding countless revival meetings promoting his reforms. In order to promote internationally, Tai Xu went on lecture tours through the US, France, England and Germany. In 1923 he called the first World Buddhist Conference in session, an iteration of which is still held annually. Late Life, 1929-1947 Unfortunately, nearly all of Tai Xu's associations and schools had to be closed down eventually. Some due to war, financial difficulty or because of opposition from conservative clergy. Ironically, the government financed a lecture tour through South Asia, but only in the hope to gain from it some assistance in the war effort. In the final years before his death in 1947, he wrote his last text entitled History of the Failure of My Buddhist Revolution. Problems arising from individual temperaments were certainly many and those arising from circumstances were also not few. But I remain confident that my theory and inspiration had their strong points, and if they had received implementation and obtained people of sufficient leadership, I definitely could have established 
a Buddhist scholarship and system appropriate to modern China.